it's a joy and a privilege for Marie and I to come over to the church and uh, prepare to, uh, to give the Sunday school lesson again. I hope and pray that these lessons uh, are a blessing to you since most of us really are not uh, permitted to mix and, uh, and go around to the stores and so forth that, that are open. And I just trust that this has been a blessing uh, through these weeks. And we're looking forward and praying that the day is soon coming that we can get out and mix again and, and, and be together and see each other again in, in blessed Christian fellowship. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin with our lesson. Our Father, we come to you this morning. We're so grateful for our Lord. We're grateful that you love us and care for us. We're grateful that we're precious in your sight. And we just want to tell you this morning, Lord, that we love you. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we love the sweet Holy Spirit who empowers us in our Christian life. And we love this good old way, Lord. This uh, that old path that we just read about this morning. That blessed old path that uh, has been drawn through the ages by men and women of your who loved you and loved your way and who are now waiting for all your children to get home. Lord, remember all in our class, Lord, that need a special touch this morning. You know those that uh, are not doing well. I pray, Lord, you touch Brother Lee today, Brother Lee Lawrence, and that this would be a great day for him. He'd be much better and soon be able to be home. And God, I pray that you'd bless every one of our class members, wherever they are. you just bless them in their homes. You'd strengthen them, encourage them, and give us that blessed assurance that uh, God is always going to be with us. Now lead us today and bless this lesson. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our lesson today, we come to the third and the last uh, division in, in Romans. Now, beginning with uh, chapter 1, for the first seven or eight chapters, we've dealt with doctrine. We've seen, uh, first of all, we've seen tremendous uh, unrighteousness and sin. In chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul explains and brings out the depth and the depravity of sin. He names over so many vile and wicked sins. And, and those people that are occupied with them, if they realize anything, they realize how wicked that is. But then in chapter 2, he begins dealing with the self-righteous. And we soon found that the self-righteous are just as wicked as those in chapter 1. That uh, when we really believe that we have uh, that we're a little better than somebody else, that we're not, that we are not better than any other sinner, that all sinners are sinners in the sight of God. And then we begin to learn how we are justified in God's sight, that we are justified by faith and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we come today to what uh, many of the uh, theological uh, men and women have called the, uh, the shoe leather of Romans, meaning our daily walk with God. Now I want you to notice, I'm going to read a few verses and then make a few comments about them. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, these verses that I've read to you, uh, Bible scholars, all of you who read your Bibles, but you've read those verses so many times. 
you've heard so many sermons preached about uh, uh, God's mercy and presenting ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. Uh, till sometimes we forget the meaning. So let's just, in our minds, go back a moment to the, to the mind of the Apostle Paul when he was writing this letter. Now, he'd been uh, preaching uh, for 20, maybe 25 years. Uh, he'd been going and giving out this great gospel. And he'd been in, in the, uh, the edge of Europe when he went to Macedonia and then over into Greece. But he'd never been over into all of the further western part of Europe. And he'd always wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to preach to those people in Rome. He wanted to go on to Spain. He wanted everybody to hear about the Lord Jesus. And his heart, his heart was so burdened for dying souls. He wanted everybody to know about the Lord. And he had this vision and this burden to go to Rome for several years. But the Lord had not permitted him to do so. And so here in, the, in the Greece, in Corinth, he got the burden to write this letter. And then when he learned that there was a little lady there that was uh, going to go to Rome. She was a business lady. She had business there. She was a Christian, a follower of God. And she agreed she would take this letter to the church or the churches in Rome. And so Paul began to write this letter and the Holy Spirit moved upon him. I wish we could have been there. I wish we could have heard him as he was walking. He, he, I suspect he started out in a sitting position. He had in the secretary there, this, this man, a Christian brother. We we're, we're, don't really know who he is or who he was. But, uh, and he wasn't being paid. He just wanted to do something for God. And he was a, a willing scribe. And so he moved down what the Apostle Paul was speaking here under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And I, I picture Paul sitting and beginning to dictate this letter. And then as the Spirit of God began to move on him, I see him in my mind's eye walking around in the room as the Spirit moves upon him. And when he comes to this part, he's been writing for hours. He's been moving under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And when he gets to this part, where, uh, where we begin, where we live every day for God, where the eyes of people are upon us, he's really moving in that room and, and uh, speaking from the bottom of his heart. Now I want you to hear what he said. I beseech you, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, this word beseech, it's a strong word. I mean, it means I beg of you, my brethren. I want you to consider what I'm about to say. Give thought to this, what I am about to say. And then when he said, therefore, he, he's talking about all these things that he's talked about before. He's talking about the great doctrines. And he's talking, more than anything, he's talking about how we're really saved. That we are saved by the mercy and the grace of God. Dear friend, no one is saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. Because we can't until God comes on the scene. We are, we are not saved by good deeds. We don't do good deeds and write them down in a book and keep a record so that one day we can tell the Lord these good things that we've done and we ought to be able to get him because it doesn't work that way. We, do, we are not saved by lighting candles, however we, good we mean by that. We are not saved by any of these things. We are saved by the grace of God. And we are saved by believing God. We believe that Jesus Christ came into this world, the darling Son of God, that he went to Calvary and died as a sacrifice for our sins, that God raised him from the dead on the third day, and that he ever lived to make intercession for our sins, and that we're saved through his precious blood. We just believe him. We just trust him. We just simply ask him, Lord, 
forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. And believe me that, he comes in. And so Paul understood that. And now he's saying, I, I, want you to, I want you to be a good Christian follower of the Lord. So I'm beseeching you. And I'm reminding you of what I've already written. And now he's saying, brethren. Now, sometimes we, we read that word and we think he's talking only to the men. I beseech you, therefore, brethren and sisters. And I beseech you, therefore, young folk. And I beseech you, therefore, teenagers. I beseech you, therefore, little boys and girls, that Jesus Christ loves you. And then he said, by the mercies of God, I've got some things I want you to do. You ever thought about God's mercy? What wonderful mercy. The Bible said God is rich in mercy. Now he's saying, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now he's not asking us to die for him. Uh, he's asking us to live for him. He says, holy. Well, you and I, we don't feel very holy, do we? We just, we don't. But God makes us holy. God forgives us of our sins and cleanses us. And God looks upon us being clothed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes us holy. And then to be acceptable to God. You go, boy, God will accept us. Somebody say, but look, I, I'm not qualified. I, I, I'm not able to do this or that. Dear friend, none of us are qualified. God does the qualify. He said, I, I'll, accept, I'll accept you if you offer yourself to me. And then he said, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to live for me in this dying world. Holy, acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. I mean, we're not doing anything outstanding. We're just being a servant of God. And, and all of us want to be worthwhile. All of us want to walk and live right before our fellow man and have the Lord to speak through us and to help people turn to Jesus and be saved. And then he said in the second verse, and, and, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, when he says world, he means age. And do not be conformed to this age. You see, uh, this age, as all ages, have, have been against God. And there's no fault in, the, in this age about God. He, he's, Paul said, now don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how do we get a new mind? How in the world we get you by, by bringing that old mind to Jesus and then really beginning to trust him. And then what, do you, what are we feeding our minds with? Are we feeding our minds with the things of this world? Are we just going and, and, and taking in all the more wicked things of this world? Listen, dear friend, you want a good mind and a clean mind, get in the word of God. Get in the Word of God. Someone says, but I've tried. You don't know, but the teacher, how many times I've tried to get in God's Word and study it, and, and it's just so difficult for me to understand. What? Don't try to understand it all. No, no, no. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you how to begin. First, begin over in the Gospels. Begin with John's Gospel. Begin, you see, John tells us so much intimate things about Jesus. Jesus said, I'm bread of life. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the Lamb of God. I'm the, I'm the true way. And, and just get in there. And then, I love the Psalms. I do. I, I don't really enjoy poetry. And so I've tried. But I just can't. But the Psalms has a sweet and a melody, and, and, and I find God in the Psalms. And just simply sit down there with the Psalms and the Proverbs and begin just asking God, Lord, I want a new mind. I want to be transformed. And I want my mind renewed and I'm turning to the Word of God and then to pray to the Lord every day. Now, look at verse 3. For I say through 
the grace given to the each and every one who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now Paul's really getting down here where the leather meets the road. He's saying to, to me and he's saying to you, uh, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. <laughs> I can remember when I began preaching many, many years ago and uh, started pastoring. And uh, uh, boy, I thought, well, I'm a good preacher. <laughs> oh, oh, what a fool to say that. I'm, I'm, I have all these years of experience, and I'm still not a good one. You see, it's not a matter of putting ourselves up there. Put God, put the Lord, and then your brother and your sister ahead of you. Ahead of you, just just not trying. To, just let God give you what He wants you to have. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God hath dealt to each one the measure of faith. Now He gives us all faith, and some of us seem to have more faith than others. Some of us seem to be able to trust him more. Listen, for as we have many members in one body, but all of the members do not have the same function. Now, now understand here, the apostle is telling us that the body of Christ is like a, a natural body. That's what, he, what he's saying here. And as the body has many parts, a head, eyes, and, and ears, and a nose, and a mouth, and arms and hands and feet and, and legs and that but they're all necessary and that the hand can't say to the foot uh, look up here I'm, a, I'm higher up than you are I don't have any need of you the body has need of every one of its members and we have the church that God has called every person contributes to something in that in the world of the Lord. And that's why he's saying, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Every Christian is given a, a gift. Now some are given more than one gift. I've had uh, many pastor friends that I know that had the ability to preach and the ability to sing. Oh, what a blessing. What a, what a blessing a pastor is who can sing as well as preach, who can help bring blessings through music. Music is such a blessing. Listening to the hymns of the church, just letting them ring out in our heart and in our soul and make us think of God and one another. And so <clears throat> God gives everybody a gift. He may give to some of us one or two gifts and he may give to others three or four gifts, but everybody has a gift. I hear somebody say, but I don't know what mine is. Well, ask God. He's, he'll show you what your gift is. Now, Having then gifts different according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. Ask God to use us. Well, I hear folks our age, my age, saying, but I'm, I'm old and I'm, I don't get out much anymore. What kind of use am I? Well, God has something for you to do. It may be to pray, to make a list of all the people in your church that you know about, your class, your Sunday school class, especially, that have a need of prayer and pray for them every day. Make a list of all the members in there and pray over each one of them, asking God to meet their needs. That's one of the things that we can do. Now then, he said, uh, if you have the gift of prophecy, uh, use that. Uh, now, prophecy here is, is not meaning, it, it's not meaning foretelling something. It's meaning saying a good word, 
saying a good word. People need to hear a good word. People need to hear an encouraging word. And then he said, let's do this in proportion to our faith. Or our ministry, let us use it in our ministry. God gives some people that ability to minister to people. Have you ever known anybody that when they come in the room, they seem to light it up? When they, when they come into your presence, it's a joy to see them. They've got that gift to minister, to meeting the needs of others. And many of you in our class have that gift. You've got that gift to minister and to help people along the way. And he that teaches in teaching, we thank God. We thank God for our, for our church that had to, that's a teaching church. Now, I love to hear the gospel preach. I love to hear our pastor preach. I love to hear other great men of God preaching. But I love to hear teaching. That, that teaching is that where we really live and helps us in, to grow in our Christian experience. And then he who exhorts in exhortation, that's somebody that's going around and, and when they speak, they lift you up. When they, when they speak, they give you, I mean, you just, you feel like you're being drawn into the presence of God. Thank God for the exhorter. Thank God for somebody that cares. And then, he who gives with liberality. I mean, that gives cheerfully and gives lovingly. I heard, I heard uh, uh, Franklin Graham just this week, the state of New York is going to charge Samaritan's Purse income tax. Uh, they came back, they put tents up to treat this terrible disease. They brought doctors in and nurses that apparently they are paying. And now the state of New York is saying, you've got to pay us income tax. We don't care if you came here and help people. You're going to pay us income tax. And uh, you know, when I thought of her dad, I thought, I tell you right now, I tell New York, we're exempt. We're Christians, and we're not going to do Franklin Graham come on there. And he always talks about Jesus. Always talks about Jesus. He came on there, and he said, that's all right. We're going to pay it. And he said, uh, it, it won't be easy. But he said, it wouldn't have been easy. But he said, there's already been one businessman didn't want to be known, but he said, Brother Franklin, I'll pay you those taxes. Don't worry about it. I'll pay you those taxes. Here's a, here, this man that's going to pay those taxes has that gift of God to willing to give. But then, th this world, it's, it's a little funny. When you, you listen uh, to, uh, during this problem, uh, there have been some movie stars. There's been some politicians. There have been some wealthy people that have, uh, that have given a million here and a million there. But you know what they do? They are sure that you and I know about it. I think of, of the Pharisees in Jesus' day. When they got ready to give in the temple, they waited till everybody else had given. And then they woke up and they got somebody that, uh, around them to ring a bell. And to say, look, brother, so-and-so, he's ready to give his offering. Jesus said they got the only reward they're going to get. You, you see, when we have the gift of giving, we're not trying to tell people that people know what we're doing. We're giving from our heart. And then on that note, I think of all the people in this world, of God's people, that are not wealthy but still have that gift. And they give it without concern. You ever thought about the mission work twice a year in the Southern Baptist Convention? At Christmas, we give to the Lottie Moon. And at, and at Christmas, uh, on Christmas, we give the Lottie Moon and it April to Annie Armstrong. We give foreign missions and home missions. And you know where that money comes from? Just ordinary people, everyday people who want to give because they want the gospel. And what cares all our churches on? 
week after week, year after year. It's just the common man and woman that loves Jesus. And they're breathing, they write that check, and they drop it in the offering, and they're saying to God, I love you, and I, I want to serve you. My gift, it, you know what? If the gift that Maria and I give every Sunday, and we're tithing, but if we didn't give this church next Sunday, our time, it's not that big, they wouldn't miss it. They wouldn't miss it. But we give it because we, we love God and we love our people. And everybody else in the church does that. And, and when you put it together, it meets the needs. Grace of giving. Now, he said, and we're going to rush. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't just love people you think love you. Don't tell somebody, I love you and I'm going to talk about you. He said, abhor what's evil. Turn from it. Flee from it. Cling to what's good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, give it preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Not being, not being lazy in doing good. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. The more we do for Jesus, the brighter our hope grows. Patient and tribulation. Look, we're having a difficult time right now. But there's a better day coming, a brighter day coming. Just be patient and wait on the Lord. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Let's don't forget, every day to pray, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. That's what he meant by walking with the Lord every day. Well, God bless you, and we trust this will be a blessing to you today, and we'll look forward to seeing our friends being with you again next Lord's Day. God bless you. God bless you.